Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you so much to the organizers to invite us to this uh, uh, forum. <clears throat> the previous talks have been fascinating and uh, we really enjoyed them. Uh, so today, uh, Ann and I are gonna present a tag team uh, uh, series of talks that really focus on the critical mineral mapping efforts by uh, from national to the international scales, linking the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative and the Critical Min Minerals Mapping Initiatives. As Jeff said, we're going to give uh, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of our USGS Earth Mapping Resources Initiative, which is really a national program for acquiring data for critical mineral resources, and then transition to Anne, who's going to show how some of these data can be applied to understanding uh, concealed large mineral systems in, in the US. So uh, before we get going, as Jeff alluded, uh, the USGS has a slightly different role in the US federal government uh, compared to other national geological surveys. The USGS Mineral Resources Program delivers impartial non-regulatory science and information to increase the understanding of ore formation, undiscovered mineral resource potential, mineral production, consumption, and how these minerals interact with the environment. Our science enables federal, state, and local governments, the public, tribes, and private industry to make more informed decisions on many matters that are critical to the management of the nation's natural resources. In our role as an impartial purveyor of information, the USGS does not promote exploration or mineral resource development. As many of our previous speakers have alluded to, uh, the critical minerals are used throughout the global economy. And as the world transitions more to a, a, a greener energy generations, the, the increased demand is going to uh, supersede our supply, even uh, through recycling efforts. And as you can see in this slide, uh, critical minerals are used throughout several major sectors of all of our economies, from energy generation, to healthcare, to uh, national defense and security, as well as transportation. So it's well known in this audience, the role of understanding the geology and geologic framework for trying to understand where uh, permissive areas are for hosting critical minerals. So in recognition of this, the USGS stood up a new program called the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative. And this is a wonderful partnership with, uh, between the USGS and our state geological uh, surveys to generate state-of-the-art geologic mapping, geophysical surveys, and LIDAR data uh, across the nation to help identify areas that are permissive for hosting critical minerals. We're currently at a $10.6 million effort and we're collecting uh, new detailed geologic maps, airborne magnetic and radiometric surveys, LIDAR surveys, as well as helping to support the preservation of data for critical mineral resources held at the state geological surveys. But as all of us know, these kind of basic data are, feed into so many other applications, not only for mineral deposit in, um, information, but as well as to groundwater studies, energy, as and uh, understanding concealed natural hazards. So as, as was previously identified, each nation has their own list of critical minerals. This particular uh, uh, list shows the 35 that have been identified for the US. Well, being charged with understanding where these uh, different commodities occur on the landscape is a big, tall order. And so we had to break it into smaller uh, uh, manageable uh, phases of the project to assess for these. And really to assess for a, one particular commodity is impractical. We really need to pivot our thinking towards understanding how that particular uh, commodity of interest actually fits into ore deposit models and uh, more uh, generally mineral systems models. So the mineral systems approach is what we've been uh, uh, using heretofore so that we can rapidly uh, map areas that are permissive for the various critical minerals. And this effort really is uh, 
just a, a conceptual framework to understand a family of ore deposit types that are genetically linked in time, space, and share tectonic processes. This effort really has been bolstered by the partnership with our colleagues in Canada and Australia. And recently, uh, uh, Al Hofstra and Doug Kreiner have released the first framework for uh, how we're thinking about this uh, in a mineral systems uh, mindset. And I invite you to, to look at their, their report. Um, so this, th this is an example I'm showing here of how one can apply the, the, the mineral system framework to get at several different deposit types that, are, that occur in that framework. In this example on the left is, is a cartoon of the kinds of deposits that occur with mineral systems that are related to porphyry, copper, molly, uh, and gold uh, mineral systems. And when you do an assessment for that mineral systems, you instantly are doing an assessment for numerous different deposit types, like those listed here. You're doing an assessment for the uh, principal commodities that commonly are associated with those mineral systems. And more importantly to this discussion, critical minerals occur as co-products and byproducts of many of these principal commodities in the different ore deposit types. So by employing a mineral systems framework, one can um, more efficiently get at trying to identify areas that are permissive for hosting various critical mineral deposits. We recently have uh, just published an assessment for the uh, uh, mineral systems that host the commodities shown on the right in this slide. But you can see that these are broad areas that uh, we've defined. And so in order to try and hone in on where to uh, spend our precious resources on collecting new minerals information, we've worked in partnership with the state geological surveys to identify those areas that are lacking modern geologic maps, that are uh, deficient in aerial mag coverage, which is critical for understanding concealed deposits and the fr tectonic framework in which they sit, as well as to, uh, to provide new LIDAR data for areas to help uh, map the topography and the geology f that would host the, the mineral deposits. So in, in partnership with the states, we have identified those areas and we're, we just got this going in FY19. So we uh, launched uh, our 14 new geologic mapping projects in FY19. The geologic mapping projects are being done by the state geological surveys. Uh, and we've given a two year period uh, 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 time for folks to get their geologic mappings uh, complete. So we're, we're starting to st see the first of these geologic maps come out uh, now and they'll start being published uh, midsummer, I predict. We've been able to stand up about five to six uh, new airborne geophysical surveys per year, as well as conduct LIDAR surveys. So in, in FY21, uh, which this map does not show our footprints for our FY21 projects. We're just finalizing those now, um, but, but we're going to be uh, supporting 14 geological uh, surveys for uh, traditional geologic mapping projects, as well as to de develop 3D geologic models uh, and uh, new ge regional uh, geochemical recon projects uh, and new uh, LIDAR uh, surveys. So essentially, Earth MRI is, is a conveyor belt for bringing new data to the public in areas permissive for hosting critical minerals. So in conclusion, uh, before I turn this over to Anne, the takeaway is uh, Earth MRI is, is, uh, totally relies on our state geological surveys as partners to provide this new data. The new data are, are supporting fresh interpretations of our US uh, mineral resources and informing mineral deposit models and applications that are applicable globally. And it's still early days in this program. We are just starting to see the stream of information come through and we're posting all of it and making it publicly available on our usgs.gov Earth MRI website. So with that, I'd like to transition over to Anne and she will present her, uh, some interpretations of some of these data. 